Hello everyone and welcome to this session on energy in GCSE chemistry. The purpose of this one hour online demonstration is to revise energy and correct any misconceptions of energy at this level. There will be demonstrations given, questions and mini tasks to carry out and revision of key energy concepts. The learning objectives of this session are as follows. To understand that energy is conserved, to understand and explain why state changes occur in terms of the energy required to break into molecular forces and the kinetic energy of the particles involved. To understand and explain how fuels react with oxygen to release energy. To define and explain the meaning of the terms exothermic and endothermic. To understand the correlation between the energy change of a system and the heat change to the surroundings and to explain that the activation energy is the minimum energy required for a reaction to occur. There will be an opportunity at the end of the lesson for you to assess how well you understand these objectives to help you and your teacher see what you have learned from this lesson. So let's start by asking what is energy? Please take a minute to write down your ideas about what energy is. You can give a written description of what you think energy is, or you can give examples of energy sources or applications. Please leave a blank space between each idea you create, as we will add more information to these later. It doesn't matter if your answers are right or wrong, just write whatever you can think of down. You may now pause this video. Time's up. So the official definition of energy is the ability to do work. There are a huge variety of processes, both in nature and man-made, which release or take in energy from the surroundings. Here are some examples that I have come up with. Food. The process of digesting food releases energy. That energy release then allows us to do work by, for example, playing a game of tennis or learning new chemistry concepts. Trees and plants. You will already know that trees and plants take in energy from the sun via a process called photosynthesis. This allows a reaction to take place which produces glucose, a sugar that the plant can use for growth. And finally, wind turbines, an example of sustainable energy transformers. The energy from the wind does work to spin the turbine, which transfers energy to the generator, which then converts that energy to electricity. So now that we have had a look at what energy actually is, Take another minute to write down some examples of energy in chemistry. These can be from reactions or processes you have already learnt about in your chemistry studies or otherwise. Again, please leave a blank space between each idea you note down and remember that it doesn't matter if your answers are right or wrong. You may now pause this video. Time's up. Energy changes occur in all chemical reactions and phase changes. Some notable examples of chemical changes include In fireworks Fireworks are first fired into the air as a result of the oxidation of gunpowder. Energy is released in the form of heat, light and sound. The beautiful colour and light display you see once the fireworks are up in the air is as a result of burning metal compounds, which we will see in action in a few moments. This is an example of an exothermic reaction, which we will go into more detail about later. In lit candles, there is both a state change going on here, what with solid, melted and vaporised wax present, and a chemical reaction occurring that releases energy, allowing the flame to continue to burn. We will look into the chemistry of candles a bit later on. And when ice cream melts, as you will know already, when ice cream is taken out of the freezer, it melts into a liquid. This is because it has taken in the heat energy from the surroundings. We will also look further into state changes later on in this session. Here is an example of energy being released in a reaction named the Ferro Serpent. An aluminium tray filled with sand, sugar, sodium hydrogen carbonate and sprayed with ethanol is lit, producing the black snake. This video was demonstrated and produced by Tim Harrison and Johnny Furs.
In this demonstration, iron powder is burned in a flame from a Bunsen burner in air, a reaction similar to that which occurs in fireworks. It is an exothermic reaction between iron and oxygen, creating iron oxide. The demonstrator in this video is Tim Harrison and the video was filmed and edited by Dr Johnny Furs. This video, titled The Screaming Jelly Baby Experiment, again demonstrated by Tim Harrison and produced by Dr Johnny Furs, is an excellent example of a chemical reaction that releases energy. One jelly baby is approximately 75% in sugar, thus each sweet can release 100 kilojoules of energy. Assuming all of the energy is transferred and there is no waste energy, this will be sufficient to raise 300 millilitres of water from 20 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius, or for a person weighing 70 kilograms to sleep for about 30 minutes or sit in the classroom for another 10 minutes. Energy in chemical reactions is conserved. This means that the amount of energy in the universe at the end of a chemical reaction is the same as it was before the reaction took place. If a reaction transfers energy to the surroundings, then the product molecules must have less energy than the reactants by the amount transferred. Energy is not used up or created in a reaction. You will often hear the phrases generate energy or produce energy and use up energy. The use of this language is misleading and incorrectly implies that energy can be created or destroyed. Energy is only ever transferred from one form to another. So let's explore the energy transfer from a hot cup of tea. First, sketch this hot mug of tea into your textbooks. What happens to the energy from this hot mug of tea as it cools? Draw an arrow from the diagram to indicate the direction of this energy transfer and give a reason for your answer. You have two minutes to do this. Please pause the video here. Time's up. So, as the hot cup of tea cools, energy is transferred to the surroundings, as indicated by this arrow, leaving a cold mug of tea that is no longer transferring energy to the surroundings. Remember, energy has not run out here. As you all know, energy is absorbed when changing state from solid to liquid and liquid to gas, and released when changing state from gas to liquid and liquid to solid. The amount of energy required to change state depends on how strong the forces are between the molecules in the substance. So, the stronger the intermolecular forces in the liquid, for example, the more energy is required to break them to form the gas. As the energy of a substance is increased, the kinetic energy of the particles increases, causing molecules to expand. It is worth noting that intermolecular forces are forces between the molecules, not the bonds holding the elemental atoms together in a compound. We can see this from the diagram on the right. When water evaporates, the forces between water molecules are broken by absorbing energy from heat. As the heat increases, the kinetic energy of the water molecules increases, causing them to expand and lengthening the distance between the molecules. As the gas cools, the opposite occurs, where the kinetic energy of the gas molecules decreases, reducing the distance between molecules. The molecules then become close enough to form intermolecular forces, and energy is released as they do so, condensing to form liquid water. Take one minute to answer this question. Why do different substances have different melting and boiling points? Please pause the video here. The reason different substances have different melting and boiling points is because substances will have different chemical properties and thus have different intermolecular forces which will vary in strength and therefore require different amounts of energy to break. Let's compare the boiling points and melting points of water and candle wax. Water, as you will know, 
has a melting point or freezing point of 0 degrees Celsius and a boiling point of 100 degrees. Before I tell you what the melting and boiling points of candle wax are, take a quick guess and write it down on your notebook. If you need a clue, think about the state of candle wax at room temperature. Candle wax has a melting point or solidifying point between 46 degrees and 68 degrees and a boiling point of above 350 degrees. You will have hopefully noticed that candles are solid at room temperature, unlike water, and thus the melting point must be higher than room temperature. These melting and boiling points are much higher than that of water, and thus the candle wax must have stronger forces between molecules that require more heat energy to break. The average temperature of a candle flame is approximately a thousand degrees. Therefore, the candle wax vaporises when the candle is lit. It is worth mentioning here that candle wax is made from hydrocarbons, most of which are alkanes. So, with that in mind, does anyone know what happens to the vaporised candle wax in a lit candle? I will give you one minute to discuss with a partner and write down an answer. Please pause the video here. The answer to the question of what happens to the vaporised wax in a lit candle can be explained in the next slide on fuel oxygen systems. Fuels are chemicals which can react with oxygen or air. The fuel is oxidised which causes energy to be released to the surroundings. Hydrocarbons can be fuels, therefore candle wax acts as a fuel. The vaporised candle wax reacts with oxygen producing gaseous carbon dioxide and water, and releasing energy as indicated by the flame. Take one minute to write down an answer to the question, can you light a candle in space? Give an explanation for your answer. Please pause the video here. The answer is no because there is no oxygen in space for the fuel to react with in order to combust, which would produce the flame. It is a common misconception that fuels store energy, which is released when they are heated. In fact, it is the reaction of fuels with oxygen that creates an energy change, which is released to the surroundings. It is therefore beneficial to label them as fuel oxygen systems to highlight the importance of oxygen in this reaction. This video, titled The Whoosh Bottle Experiment, presented and narrated by Tim Harrison and produced by Dr Johnny Furs, is a great demonstration of the combustion of an alcohol with oxygen, an example of a fuel oxygen system. Here we're looking at the combustion, the complete combustion of a fuel. Now there are three possibilities of fuels that can be burned in a whoosh bottle. A whoosh bottle is merely a water canister that has been removed from the water supply. We can use the alcohols methanol, ethanol or propan-2-ol. In this experiment we're going to use methanol and that's what the equations refer to. To do the whoosh bottle experiment we need to produce some vapour. Methanol and the other alcohols are highly volatile so shaking them up inside of the plastic bottle causes some of the liquid to vaporize until the air above it reaches saturation. Of course there is still air above it so there is still oxygen. We pour out the surplus alcohol so that we have a fuel air mixture in the container and then remembering the fire triangle from when you were younger scientists we need some activation energy to get it going so we're going to provide that with a flame on the end of a spill. The combustion shows the conversion of chemical energy from the fuel-air mixture reaction being released as heat energy because the bottle gets warm, as some light energy because you can see a flame, and as sound energy. One of the chemical products of complete combustion is water, which you can see being poured out of the water bottle that was perfectly dry to start with, and I'd already emptied out the alcohol. The second one is carbon dioxide. 
which we haven't tested for in this video clip. Of course, you could use lime water to go from a colorless to a cloudy mixture, should you so wish. We've repeated the experiment in the dark and in slow motion. Another exciting example of a fuel oxygen system from Tim Harrison and Johnny Fires here. In this video, bubbles of methane and alkane are being satellite, firstly on a heat proof mat as shown. Methane is reacting with oxygen here to produce carbon dioxide and water vapour, which releases energy to the surroundings, as shown by the flame. Now have a go at these questions, which will cover some of the topics that we have just looked at. You can do this work individually or in pairs. You can now pause this video for six minutes. Your six minutes should be up. Let's go through the answers. So the correct answer to question two which diagram below best describes the melting of an ice cube, where the arrow indicates the direction of energy transfer, is B. When an ice cube melts, energy is transferred from the surroundings to the ice cube, which has a lower concentration of energy. Once the ice cube begins to melt, it has a higher concentration of energy. Question three, explain why chocolate melts at 32 degrees Celsius. Chocolate melts at 32 degrees because the heat energy is sufficient to break the intermolecular forces in chocolate at that temperature, and the kinetic energy of the chocolate molecules increases as the heat increases, causing the molecules to move further apart. And for question four, explain what happens to a gas as it cools. For one mark, you need to have said that as a gas cools, the kinetic energy of the gas particles decreases. And for the second mark, you will need to have mentioned that as a result of the reduced kinetic energy of the particles, they move closer together. Once the temperature is below the boiling point, the gas molecules will condense into a liquid. This next part of the session is going to focus on exothermic and endothermic reactions and activation energy. You will know from your studies already that an exothermic reaction releases energy to the surroundings, and as a result, the surroundings feel hotter. A good way to remember this is to note that exothermic is energy exiting the system. This can be demonstrated by this diagram. Energy is transferred from the system to the surroundings in an exothermic reaction, resulting in a negative energy change of reaction. Remember that the energy change of a reaction is measuring the energy change in the system, which is why the sign of energy change is negative here, as the system has lost energy. In contrast, an endothermic reaction is where energy is absorbed by the system, and as such, the surroundings feel colder. Another way to remember this is that in an endothermic reaction, energy is entering the system. The energy change here is positive, as the system has gained energy. This diagram may help you to grasp what is meant by the system and the surroundings. In the classroom, you might be asked to do an experiment and note the energy change that occurs from this experiment. If you were to do this experiment in solution in a beaker, you would detect the energy change by putting a thermometer in the solution. If the reaction were exothermic, then the solution would get hotter and an increase in temperature would be noted. You might be thinking, but hang on a minute, in an exothermic reaction, the energy change is negative. So why is the temperature increasing? Well, in this scenario, the surroundings is the solution and the system is always the reaction on a molecular level, which we cannot see. Therefore, the negative energy change describes the system as having lost energy to the surroundings, which is in this case, the solution. Therefore, the solution increases in energy and heats up. The opposite would be true if the reaction were endothermic. 
the system would be increasing in energy, therefore a positive energy change, and the surroundings decreasing in energy, and thus the solution feels colder. This cannon fire demonstration by Tim Harrison and Johnny Furs is an excellent example of a highly exothermic reaction between hydrogen peroxide and potassium manganate. The overall reaction is shown here. Hydrogen peroxide and ethanol are mixed together in a heat proof dish. This is then set alight to provide the activation energy for the reaction. The potassium manganate crystals are then added to the mixture. This burning glucose reaction, again by Tim Harrison and Dr. Johnny Furs, is another good example of a highly exothermic reaction. Glucose reacts with potassium chlorate and sulfuric acid is used as a catalyst. Glucose and potassium chlorate, both white powders, are mixed together thoroughly. Then a few drops of sulfuric acid is added. This reaction is highly exothermic as indicated by the flame. This solid-to-solid -solid reaction is a good example of an endothermic reaction where a vast temperature drop is detected. If you take barium hydroxide solid and ammonium chloride solid and mix them in a beaker, mix them thoroughly, the temperature can drop to roughly minus 10 degrees centigrade. Indeed, if you were to sit the beaker on top of a piece of polystyrene with some water under the beaker it would eventually freeze and you could lift up the polystyrene by picking up the beaker. In this experiment we use the digital thermometer to show the temperature drop. We also used a sonic thermometer. Our sonic thermometer we get at once in a while. It's a thermocouple that is connected to a loudspeaker system high pitched high temperature, low pitch low temperature. And we dip the thermocouple into some ice water and into some room temperature water just to show you the difference. The activation energy is the minimum amount of energy that particles must have in order for a reaction to take place. All reactions have a minimum energy requirement. You may have noticed that in the exothermic cannon fire experiment that we saw a few moments ago, Ethanol was lit before the reaction took place. It might seem counterintuitive to put energy into a system that is exothermic and therefore releases energy to the surroundings. But the reason that we do this is because of this minimum energy requirement.
Now have a go at exercise two, which covers both of the topics that we have just looked at. You can do this work individually or in pairs. You have eight minutes to complete this, and you may now pause this video. Let's now go through the answers to exercise two. So question one, is the reaction happening in a candle exothermic or endothermic? The reaction happening in a lit candle is exothermic. The candle wax is acting as a fuel that is reacting with oxygen, releasing energy. We can observe this energy as heat and light. Question two, why do you have to strike a match for it to burn? This is because of the activation energy. The friction of striking the match against the box provides the activation energy for the reaction. If you have just said activation energy here, you get one mark. Question three. The reaction between glycerol and potassium manganate has a negative energy change and produces flames. Is this reaction exothermic or endothermic? The reaction between glycerol and potassium manganate is exothermic. A reaction with a negative energy change is exothermic because the system is releasing energy to the surroundings. Therefore, the surroundings have more energy and feel hotter. And finally, question four. Give an example of an exothermic reaction and an example of an endothermic reaction. Some examples of exothermic reactions include oxidation reactions in fireworks and combustion reactions in car engines. These reactions are exothermic as they release energy in forms of heat, light and sound. Some examples of endothermic reactions include sports injury cooling packs. The temperature drop when these cooling packs are activated indicates that the reaction is endothermic as the system has gained energy from the surroundings and so the surroundings feel colder. You should now be able to understand that energy is conserved, understand and explain why state changes occur in terms of the energy required to break into molecular forces and the kinetic energy of the particles involved. You should be able to understand and explain how fuels react with oxygen to release energy Define the terms exothermic and endothermic and give examples of reactions for both terms. You should also be able to understand the correlation between the energy change of a system and the heat change to the surroundings. And finally, you should be able to explain the activation energy is the minimum energy required for a reaction to occur. Thanks very much for watching this video. I really hope you've learned a lot from this session.